my initial kind of intro very quickly and remind you guys that the days are short, the days are long, but the years are short. So don't take things too seriously and just enjoy every day as much as you can. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, I'm going to just quickly go over my journey. So I did four years of undergrad, four years of medical school, four years of residency, and then two years of fellowship. And um, you can see the places that I went. So if any of you are considering any of these places or have any questions, you can always reach out to me. Um, but as you can see, it's a, it's a pretty long journey. Um, and, uh, you know, you want to understand what you're getting into. That's why it's great that you guys are shadowing. Um, I always mention that there's so many different ways to practice medicine. So within any field, you can be in sole academics or private practice or telemedicine or a combination of all three of these. So really, you know, there's so many ways to practice medicine and you just want to remember that. Um, and then you can focus on one area within a specialty or you can, you know, really be broadly treating patients within a specialty too. So today, uh, and then also when I always talk about med peds a little bit. So the reason that I'm triple board certified is because I did um, a combined residency called Internal Medicine and Pediatrics or MedPeds. And it's a four year training program as opposed to three years of you know, internal medicine or three years of pediatrics where you kind of do a combined program where you get trained in both um, you know, adult medicine and uh, pediatric medicine. And you can take both boards and in internal medicine and pediatrics. And then that means that you can subspecialize within any kind of specialty within either of those. Um, I chose to do med peds because I always knew that I, I was most likely going to go into allergy and immunology. Um, I like allergy and immunology because no matter what, if you do just adult medicine or just pediatric medicine, when you're an allergist immunologist, you end up seeing both adults and kids. And so um, I also like that there, it's very varied. You treat patients from head to toe. And again, with any field, you can be outpatient, academic, or combination. Or now with me, I'm, I'm, I'm very much involved in telemedicine. So there's lots of ways to practice. So we're going to jump right in. And I know today we talked about kind of doing more asthma cases. And so I don't remember if we had kind of really gone into this case, but I think I just briefly kind of went through the history and then we didn't really have too much time. So I'm going to do the same case, but we're really going to dive into like the details of it today. So uh, you know, 12 year old female patient comes in with her mom for evaluation of uncontrolled asthma. So she's already been diagnosed with asthma, right? The patient has been coughing and wheezing every day and the symptoms are worse at night and keep her up. Um, she's using her albuterol inhaler. So albuterol is a medication that um, we'll discuss a little bit later, but it's used in asthma um, as a rescue medication. And she's using that four to five times a day to help open up her lungs. She was also put on Flovent. Flovent is another type of asthma inhaler medication, which is an inhaled steroid. So it reduces the inflammation in the airways. And she was put on that in the hospital um, and she's supposed to use that twice a day. She's been to the ER three times this past year since moving to a shelter system. So um, she was hospitalized once but she's never been intubated for her asthma. So these are all the important kind of questions that we ask all of our asthma patients. So, you know, I, I think in all of medicine, the history and how we kind of extract that history from our patients is just so important. Um, and that's really, really the crux of it. And especially with asthma, sometimes like this little girl might have just used her albuterol. So on exam, she might look great. She might not have any... Um, you know, visible or audible signs of um, distress. And so um, the exam isn't always helpful, but what's really helpful is getting a good history from the patient. So for her, we see that she's coughing and wheezing every day, which is not a good sign, that it's keeping her up at night. Um, and for some reason, asthma in general tends to be worse at night and in the morning. So it almost has this weird circadian rhythm. Um, and so again, at night and early in the morning is when patients seem to have, um, the, uh, 
you know, more frequent problems with their asthma. And then um, the fact that she's been to the ER three times is also not a good sign. It tells you that um, for one thing we want to see, is she using the ER as kind of her management strategy for her asthma? I mean, it's good that she's in to see me um, finally, but a lot of times asthma patients will end up just going from one ER to the next or urgent care to the next urgent care and will get put on um, oral steroids um, for their asthma over and over again because it makes them feel better, but it's not the right way to manage their uh, asthma overall. So let's, let's he see a little bit more about what's going on with her. So on physical exam, she has only mild expiratory wheezes, heard. The mom says that she just used her albuterol inhaler 10 minutes ago. So again, if she just used her inhaler, that means that her exam findings are going to be different, right? If I had examined her um, 20 minutes before, then her airways would probably be a lot more tight. I'd probably hear a lot more wheezing and I'd be a little bit more worried, right? So it's really important whenever you see somebody with asthma that when they're in and you're examining them, that you ask them, did you just use your inhaler? Because that will help us know if, you know, if their exam is uh, consistent with what it would be pre-treatment. Pre and then um, her nasal turbinates, which are the tissues inside of her nose, also look a little bit different than they should. They're pale, which means that the tissue looks a little bit lighter than it should, and it's boggy, which means it looks like it's a little bit bigger than it should. And then there's a bluish color to it. So these are all the classic signs of uh, an allergic nose. Um, so not everybody with asthma has to have allergies, but um, when it's allergic asthma, then there's other signs that we can look for to kind of help us see that, okay, maybe this has some allergic component to it. So for her, it might be the case that allergies are playing a role with her asthma too. And then the social history is always important with most patients for any condition. And here we see that she lives with her mom who lost her job, unfortunately, in the last year and was forced to move into the shelter system. So unfortunately, uh, I see this a lot in New York City. Um, and, um, and, you know, then we find out more that the shelter is unclean and the mom has also noticed mice and cockroaches. And, um, and then we also see on social history that because her asthma is not controlled, she's frequently missed school. So that's actually a very common thing too. Asthma uh, can be life-threatening uh, for severe asthma, and actually 10 people in this country die of asthma a day, which I think a lot of people don't, um, don't know, and uh, I think it's important to remember that, that asthma can be very severe, but on top of that, it can also lead to a lot of quality of life issues, like missing school, missing work. For a lot of kids that have severe asthma, it can, um, it can really take them, like, uh, it can really hold, they can really be held back in school because of their asthma if it's not well controlled. So these are all important things that we always need to ask our patients. So, you know, a couple things here, I think, um, you know, for the in-office testing, so skin prick, um, if she, so for this patient in particular, if she was um, I might not actually have uh, tested her in the office on that same day because um, if she's having issues with her asthma, the skin prick testing is essentially safe, but very rarely um, it can trigger an allergic reaction for patients that are really sensitive. So for her, actually, I might have waited or I might have sent her for blood testing. So blood testing um, is obviously, you know, they take some of your blood out, they test it, and we can see what you're allergic to. So you wouldn't have that risk of having a reaction to the testing. Um, but with skin prick testing, which I think I have a picture of actually in the next case, but skin prick testing we've talked about previously with the allergies is a test that we do, do on the arms. And we um, put a little bit of the protein from dust mites, cockroaches, mice, trees, weeds, all these things onto the skin. And we prick it on the top layer of the skin to see if the person reacts. So in her case, um, let's pretend we did it two weeks later once I had her asthma under better control. She is positive to dust mites, cockroach, and mice. And as we remember, you know, the mom said that recently they're in a space with mice and cockroaches and also likely dust mites. Um, although dust mites are everywhere. Um, they're, you know, little tiny mites that we can't see with our bare eye. They're found all over the place and they live off of this 
flaking of our skin. So they're most commonly found in our bedding. And that's why it's really important to wash your sheets in hot water at least once a week to kind of get rid of the dust mites. And, and we're not allergic to the dust mite themselves. We're actually allergic to their droppings. So, um, so when you're washing your sheets, you're actually getting rid of like the droppings. And, um, and also the pillows themselves can um, turn into, so dust mites, what they do is they can burrow into the pillow and go inside the pillow and then um, basically poop all, all over the inside of the pillow. And then your, your entire pillow is just full of dust mite poop, which obviously if you're allergic to dust mite, droppings, that's not a good thing. And so um, that's why we use pillow encasements or dust mite covers for the pillows. It's in order to prevent the dust mite from entering the pillow and pooping inside of the pillow so that all you have to take care of is the dust mite poop that's on the actual pillowcase. So I know that's a lot of information, but it's, uh, it's helpful to kind of understand why we would recommend certain things for certain patients. Uh, and then obviously for cockroaches and mice in a place like a shelter, it's really hard to control for things like that. But in someone's home, you know, we would recommend trying to get an exterminator and, you know, making sure that um, they're, they're doing their best to make sure that the kitchen is cleaned and all food is stored in like closed containers and all of that kind of stuff. Um, give me just one second. So while Dr. Gupta, before she comes back, I think we've all realized that we need to go wash our sheets. Um, that's what I learned. I'm going to wash mine right after the session. I'm personally going to go burn my mattress, so just up. <laughs> Sorry, guys. My baby was just <laughs> crying. I just wanted to... Um, so, uh, yes, I know it's super yucky and gross and it's like, oh my God, what the heck? <laughs> but these are the things that you learn as an allergist and it makes you extra hyper clean. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, let's talk a little bit. So I talked a, a little bit about the nuances of this case, but let's talk a little bit generally about what asthma is. So asthma, you know, can develop at any age, um, Although the majority of people with asthma are diagnosed in childhood, you can have adults that kind of present with asthmatic symptoms present later in life and never had any issues as a kid. And so, um, you know, in let's look at the kind of the, the, the mechanism of action of, of how the airway is affected with asthma. So here you see a normal airway. It's nice and open. Um, you know, you can see that airflow would be easily going in and out of this airway. And then this is the asthmatic airway. And here you can see that there's a muscle lining in the airways that's, uh, that gets swollen. And, um, and that inflammation builds up in the muscle lining, right? And so there's that. And then there's also excess mucus production. And then you can see with all of this excess mucus production with the um, inflammation that the airway, the patency of the airway is much smaller. So you can see that breathing out of this airway would be a lot harder. The other thing that we see here is that there's muscles around the airway, right? And those muscles are also more irritable in patients with asthma, and so they tighten more easily. And so that's what results in these symptoms of wheezing, which is a high-pitched whistling sound, and that happens usually up on exhalation, which means breathing out. And then um, the cough, which we talked about um, is worse at night. Um, and again, there's just a circadian rhythm. We're not sure why, but the symptoms will be worse at night or early in the morning. And then of course, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing because you're just not getting enough air in and out through this kind of swollen, irritated airway. And the thing with asthma is it's, it, it can be recurring and it's episodic. So there's times like, for example, I have asthma, right? And my asthma is mild intermittent. We'll go into those kind of categories. But, you know, it doesn't affect me every single day. It might not even affect me for months um, because my asthma is so uh, kind of intermittent, right? Um, and, but then if I'm around things, like for me, I have allergic asthma. And so if I'm around a cat, for example, 
um, I will start getting, um, you know, chest tightness, wheezing, shortness of breath, and um, my asthma will act up. Or for example, during certain pollen season, um, like if I go back to Michigan, I'm, I'm much more allergic in Michigan than I am in New York. And if it's like the springtime there, I'm definitely going to have some symptoms of like chest tightness and wheezing when I'm there. And so that's the important thing to remember with asthma. And that's why it's so important to get a nice clear history. Um, so, you know, that's allergic asthma, which can be triggered by allergies, but then there's also um, exercise induced asthma. So some people, and I have a little bit of that too, and that's the other thing, people can have a combination, right? They can have allergic asthma, they can have an exercise induced asthma, they can also have cold air asthma. Um, and then their asthma can also be exacerbated by viral infection. So you don't just have, um, it's not just that one thing kind of triggers your asthma, multiple things can trigger your asthma. Um, and so for some people it's exercise, for some people it's cold air um, can trigger that kind of muscle tightening and irritation. Um, and then viral infections are huge for kids and babies. And, um, and that's why this year was so interesting because we're doing so much social distancing and masking and hand washing. Um, all you know, our our kids weren't really exposed to as many viruses this year, even you know, because we were protecting everyone from COVID. And so what we noticed was that the hospital ad, um, admissions for asthma, the office visits for asthma have actually gone down over the last year because people just aren't being triggered with these viral infections, which are really commonly a cause of an increase in asthma over the winter months. So, you know, there's pros and like there are some silver linings to what's been happening over the last year. And this is one of them is just that kind of um, understanding that, you know, there is a way for us to protect ourselves against these viral infections and keep things like asthma under control with like better kind of hygiene and, um, you know, social distancing and masking kind of measures. And then, um, and then a family history. So allergic diseases do tend to run in families. For example, I, you know, my mom had asthma, my brother and my dad also have mild asthma and um, also have allergies. So it is something that can run in families, but that also, it doesn't mean that that's every time. So you could have, you could be one of the first people that has asthma um, in your family and that could be normal too. But, um, but there can be a family history predisposition. Um, and then there's different asthma types. Like I've mentioned, there's adult onset asthma, allergic asthma, then there's this asthma COPD overlap. So COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And what that means is it's usually um, more of a disease in smokers. So you could have somebody that smokes and also has underlying asthma, and then they would have this kind of asthma COPD overlap. And, um, and in those cases, you know, uh, actually a lot of treatments kind of overlap between these conditions. And, but then there's also certain things like obviously smoking cessation, um, and then being a little bit more worried in their COPD patients that they might need oxygen down the line. So with asthma, you don't tend to get to the point where somebody is dependent on, on oxygen, but, uh, with severe or moderate to severe COPD, um, that's ongoing, you can have um, the need for oxygen down the line. So that's one of the big differences. Um, and then there's also exercise induced bronchoconstriction that we talked about. And this is, you know, as you exercise, your airways actually get cooled down. So because your body is heating up, your airways cool down. So it's it's almost a form of cold air induced asthma where, where as your um, airways are kind of cooling down, you get more of that um, irritation. And then there's non-allergic asthma, which is that your asthma isn't triggered by any allergic component, um, but you still have that irritation and you still have that muscle tightening randomly. Um, and then there's occupational asthma where somebody might be exposed to certain chemicals, certain, um, uh, like for example, after 9-11, there's a lot of people that ended up having occupational asthma that were working on, on the 9-11 site and cleaning it up. So I have a lot of patients that come in that have had symptoms of asthma since 9-11. Since and then there's something called eosinophilic asthma. And eosinophilic asthma is something not newer, but it's, it's something that we have newer treatments for. 
And, um, and these patients, uh, so eosinophils are a type of white blood cell in our body, and, um, and we can check that on uh, a blood test. So we can do, oh, no, 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 no. Nunca, nunca, nunca. Lo siento. Um, sorry. And so we can do a blood test that looks at, um, you know, uh, the eosinophils in our, in our blood work, and, um, and if those are elevated, eosinophils can also cause a lot of inflammation and can lead to um, inflammation and irritation in our airways and can lead to a type of asthma. And so we're going to talk about, uh, about those treatments in a little bit. So the physical exam, like I said, in asthma, it, unless you're in the emergency room, um, seeing patients that are having like an acute attack, when patients come into um, my office, the physical exam is usually actually normal um, if they're just in for a routine visit. Um, but then there's, uh, we do something called pulmonary function tests. So pulmonary function tests are um, a way to look at what the airways, um, how inflamed the airways are. Uh, and there's different measurements that we look at, but most mostly we look at something called FEV1, which is the, um, the amount of exhaled um, velocity in the first second. So it's the, um, sorry, I'm blanking. Uh, yeah, it's the uh, forced expiratory volume. Sorry, yes, forced expiratory volume in the first second. So, um, so essentially you breathe, uh, you're using this machine um, that's attached to the computer and you breathe into this tube, you breathe out as forcefully and heavily as you can. And that first breath that you take in the first second, the machine kind of is able to quantify that. And we can see if that those numbers are kind of compatible with how tall you are, how much you weigh and your sex and all of that kind of stuff. And we have parameters for what your FEV1 should be based on all of those things. But then we also do something called pre and post testing. So what that means is that when someone comes in, I would do the breathing test on them before they take any kind of medication. So I would do their baseline. So that's their pre-test. And we would see what their FEV1 is at baseline, right? And then I would give them um, some albuterol. So that inhaler that we were talking about that this little girl is already on, that inhaler helps open up the airways quickly, okay? It basically helps relax the muscles. So I'll talk about the two different kind of, generally the two different kinds of medications we use, but the rescue medication is a medication that helps relax the smooth muscles in the airway. And that's what we give to the patient. We wait for 10 minutes. So we have the patient take the inhaler, then we wait for 10 minutes, and then we repeat the breathing test. And we see where's the baseline and the post, post meaning after medication, did that FEV1 value change by greater than 12%? So 12% is like the magic number for the FEV1 value to definitively say that, yes, this looks like asthma. Now, in a lot of cases, you might not get that 12% change, but the history and um, you know everything else kind of goes along with this is most likely asthma. So it's not a hard and fast rule. Um, a lot of what this is showing you, this change of 12% is telling you that yes, the person responds to albuterol. And that's really the key with asthma is if you have somebody that tells you that, oh, I have asthma, but then when I'm short of breath and when I'm feeling my symptoms and I use my albuterol inhaler, it doesn't help, then it's unlikely that, that it's asthma because um, asthma should respond to albuterol. And so that's that's why this diagnostic test is also looking at what is the response to albuterol. And that's how you essentially diagnose asthma. So I'm sure there'll be questions on that and we can talk about that. Um, and then also just another thing to note is that the spirometry will be what we call obstructive and not restrictive. And what that means is that um, your forced expiratory volume in the first second over your um, uh, your oh my god, sorry guys, I'm not remembering what FVC stands for right at this very second. But this is what happens when you get old and you haven't taken a, a, a test on this in a while. 
Um, so um, the forced vital capacity, sorry. So your total forced vital capacity, your total over your, um, the amount that you exhale in the first second, that will be, um, that ratio will be reduced. And that, that tells us that it's an obstructive pattern. Um, and I see that um, somebody is uh, raising their hand and I think we're gonna do all questions at the very end. Um, but definitely remember your question, we'll talk about it. And then, um, and then one thing to remember with COVID right now is that we're actually not doing spirometry right now because um, spirometry, when we do it, we have to have somebody blow out and, and, um, and it's what we call an aerosol generating procedure, which means that it releases a lot of sputum out into the air. And so that can be very dangerous for the nurse that's doing the procedure um, anyone else that's in the room or anyone else that enters the room after. So what we realized early in the pandemic was that it's not a good idea to do any kind of spirometry and even to do um, albuterol treatment, we do it through a nebulizer. There's a machine that's called a nebulizer that we can also give the albuterol through. You can either do it through an inhaler or you can do it through a nebulizer machine, which is we put the medication into this kind of machine that kind of aerosolizes the, the medication and gets it into the airways a little bit easier. And um, even that procedure we found could be um, dangerous with, with um, COVID and with the spread of COVID. So we're actually not doing any kind of um, uh, any, any of those treatments either. So this is a super tiny chart, but it kind of goes into what I was talking about earlier with kind of classifying asthma. So this chart you can see is for, oops, for patients that are 12 and older. And, um, it, and so it includes adults. And so what we look at, and this is what I was talking about, the history is so important, is that um, you know there's different categories. So I said that I have intermittent mild intermittent asthma, right? And so intermittent means that you have symptoms less than two days a week, less than two times a month, less than two days a week. And, you know, it doesn't interfere with your normal activities and that um, you don't really have any exacerbations that require oral steroids. Um, whereas for a persistent, persistent means that you're gonna have more persistent symptoms and then it's categorized into mild, moderate, or severe. And so, um, you know, so you can see, I'm not gonna go through each of these, but essentially when you're, when you're treating people with asthma, this, you, you kind of start getting into the flow of this and remembering what this chart looks like just based on, in, in your head. And you can kind of classify people just, you know, over time, just by knowing what their history is. But, you know, the things that you want to remember is that severe means that you're going to have symptoms throughout the day. Um, moderate means that you're going to have at least daily symptoms. And then mild is greater than two days a week, but not daily. So, but that's what differentiates it from intermittent is that, you know, the mild, persistent, they still have symptoms on a weekly basis. And so, um, uh, so based on these categories, um, we would decide what treatment they need, right? And so asthma treatment, there's the rescue medication and then there's the controller medication. So rescue, I've talked about a couple times, it helps with that muscle tightening or what we call bronchospasm. So rescue medications like albuterol act on this short acting beta agonist receptor. So um, these receptors are found on the muscles in our airways. And when we use this albuterol, it, um, and we, we um, kind of trigger these, um, these receptors, then it causes the muscles to relax, okay? And so agonist means that you kind of uh, trigger it, right? Antagonist would mean that you block that receptor. So in this case with albuterol, we're triggering this short-acting beta agonist, we're triggering that receptor to be activated, which relaxes the smooth muscles in the airways. So this medication you use as needed, um, and, um, and then the controller medications are, um, 
are there's a lot of categories of controller medication. So that's um, inhaled steroids, inhaled steroids um, with a long-acting beta agonist. So again, the, the, the rescue medication is a short-acting beta agonist, but there's also something called a long-acting beta agonist that kind of keeps the muscles and the airways open um, in a safe way over a prolonged period of time. So one thing to remember with the rescue medication is that this short-acting beta agonist is not meant to be used on a daily basis. If you're using it on a daily basis, then that means that your asthma is not controlled and something needs to change. We know that patients that use their short-acting beta agonist, whether it's an underlying issue with the medication or whether it's um, the fact that their asthma is in control, that these patients have a higher risk of being one of those people that dies from their asthma. So this is one of the critical things that we have to always ask our patients about with their asthma. How often are you using your albuterol? Because the thing with albuterol is that it works very quickly. So it kind of gives you this immediate relief. So it's the medication that everyone wants to reach for and use because they want to they want to be able to breathe. And so sometimes people they don't get addicted to it, uh, but they, they, it becomes a habit and they, they use it more often than they should because they just can't breathe. Um, and, uh, and now the new uh, recommendations are also talking about using an intermittent inhaled steroid um, in the intermittent kind of treatment thing. But I think that's too much for us to get into today. Um, there's too many nuances to it, but I just want to talk about just in general, the other types of medication. So again, there's the inhaled steroids, there is the long acting beta agonist, and then there's something called long acting muscarinic ag ag agents. And those are essentially um, uh, medications that um, act on a different receptor. And those um, actually were mostly used in COPD patients. But now we have data to show that those, um, that these medications also help with um, asthmatic patients. So, and it's nice when you have that COPD asthma overlap to be able to use um, some of the same medications. Uh, and then there's a leukotriene receptor antagonist, which is another type of receptor in our body that this is, uh, it's also called singular or Montelukast. So a lot of you might've heard of those medications and um, it's essentially, uh, it blocks the allergic reaction in a different in a different part of the pathway of allergic reaction. So this is mostly used for patients with allergic asthma, but we've also found that uh, these medications can also help with patients that have exercise-induced asthma. So, and then the newest um, kind of uh, medications that we have are biologics. And these are very exciting because for a long time, all we had were kind of inhaled steroids. And then if the inhaled steroids weren't working and somebody was having a, a, an exacerbation, they would be put on oral steroids. But I think everyone knows that oral steroids are just, they're not something that we wanna use for a prolonged period of time because they cause a lot of other issues in our body. They can lead to um, you know, brittle bones. They can lead to, um, over, over the course of time, it can lead to development of diabetes in certain ways. And so um, using oral steroids and weight gain and things like that. And so using oral steroids on a daily basis is not something that we wanna do. Um, and so these biologic medications are amazing because they, uh, they're essentially targeting different cell receptors and um, they disrupt the pathway that leads to inflammation and causes asthma symptoms. So there's, um, there's broad categories. There's, there's something called an interleukin-5. Interleukin-5 increases the eosinophils in the body. And you remember that eosinophils can cause... Um, can cause uh, asthmatic inflammation. And so for patients that have high levels of eosinophils and we, and they have eosinophilic asthma, for those patients, we want to block the IL-5. So there's IL-5 blocking bi biologics. So they're, they're specifically triggering, uh, targeting either the receptor to block the receptor or to actually block the IL-5 itself. So that's one way that the biologics work. Then there's, um, 
biologics that work on IL-4 receptor, and IL-4 is another type of interleukin that directly works on the type 2 inflammation or the allergic inflammation that can cause asthma. And so um, when we block that interleukin, then we can also block that underlying inflammation. So essentially, the thing to remember with all of these medications is that they're either targeting the muscles, which is what the rescue medications are doing. They're targeting the underlying inflammation directly with um, steroids or um, blocking certain pathways that lead to inflammation. And same thing with the biologics. You're blocking um, different pathways in the body that lead to inflammation um, and trying to control the inflammation in the airways in those ways. And then there's also, as a kind of a last line treatment, there's something called bronchial thermoplasty. And that's not used that often because um, it has a lot of inherent, um, you know, negative, possible negative side effects. Um, but this is where you actually go in and you do a bronchoscopy and you actually, um, for lack of a better word, you burn parts of the airway to kind of reduce that, um, to, um, to open up the airway, essentially. And so again, you know, just you can tell just by the way that I'm describing it, that it's not a procedure that you want to do lightly. And it's, it's really like one of the last things that we would consider um, for an asthmatic patient if none of these other things are working for them. Um, and then, uh, so, and then I wanted to just quickly talk about, especially for this little girl, you know, just air quality. There's outdoor air quality and then there's indoor air quality. And there's a lot of things that can affect our indoor air quality and can to the development of infections, even lung cancer, chronic lung disease, like asthma. And so, you know, and then obviously people that already have asthma can um, get worse if they're around any of these things. So, you know, our indoor environment can be, you know, there's asbestos that I think a lot of people have heard of. I think now asbestos is not as common, fortunately. We, we are um, kind of looking for that and we know uh, you know, when that needs to be remediated, but then there can be bacteria and viruses in, you know, in in indoor environments, depending on, uh, you know, uh, on various things. But then there's also like paint products, carbon monoxide monitors that we should be aware of. Carpeting can lead to increased dust. Um, like I mentioned, the cleaning supplies, household chemicals can be um, an issue for um, people with uh, occupational asthma. Uh, cockroaches, like that little girl, dust mites. Um, and then water damage inside of an environment can also lead to mold formation, which people can be allergic to and can cause breathing issues. There's formaldehyde, lead, um, mold again, um, pet dander can cause issues. Um, radon is another big thing. So there's so many things that can, um, and then secondhand smoke is a huge one. And I know that with the pandemic, more people have a tendency to stay inside. So, and if you're living with somebody that smokes, a lot of these kids would at least have a break from that while they're at school. But now that they're doing homeschool, unfortunately, these poor little munchkins are stuck at home with, you know, they're somebody that smokes. And so that's leading to issues in that um, in that front too. So there's so many things that we have to think about when we're looking at the home environment. And you know, questions that you can ask your uh, a patient or yourself if you're having symptoms is, you know, do these health symptoms improve when I leave the building? Do they return when you come back to the building? And if if it's something that's particular about a particular indoor environment, then then we need to do more research and we need to do some digging. And that's what I feel like a lot of um, allergists, like a lot of what we do is we just need to be really good historians. And we really need to figure out what is it that changed that might have caused this person's condition to get worse, um, especially if it happens quickly over like the span of one to two weeks. So that's what this next case kind of highlights is, um, you know, a 36-year-old male patient that comes in for evaluation of shortness of breath and coughing. The patient has been coughing and wheezing ever since he got a new dog. He states that the coughing and wheezing are keeping him up at night again. He was seen by his primary care doctor who feels that this sounds like allergic asthma, and he was given a prescription for albuterol inhaler which has helped, but he is using his inhaler two to three times at night and throughout the day. So we know that that's not good. 
He never had a history of asthma in the past, and he has not had any allergy evaluation in the past. So for him, you know, again, turbinates are pale, boggy, bluish in color. So it looks like he's allergic. His eyes are watery and they're injected. When you have injected eyes, that means that they're red. The white part of the eye is red. And then this is a picture of skin prick testing. So um, this person obviously had a lot more things that are positive on their on their prick testing, but all of these little um, these little inflamed areas are things that they're allergic to. And each of these things are a different allergen. So, um, you know, I know just because I did this, these two are dust mites. And then um, this one is dog for this person. But um, so you can see that, you know, each one of these inflamed is inflamed. And then the ones that are smaller, like right here, that's a negative reaction. So they might've reacted to the, like the little prick sensation, but they're not actually reacting to the allergen itself. So for him, he's allergic to dogs. So, you know, what are we going to do for him? Um, so he definitely needs, you know, he has his short acting beta agonist or the albuterol, which we're going to teach him like how often should he use it? Um, if he's using it too often, what does he need to do? But for him, do you guys think he needs to be on a controller medication? Yes, he would. So he would need to be on one of those controller medications to kind of control that underlying inflammation. So this is something that I haven't explained and I'll quickly explain that is that because asthma has those two components, components, the inflammation and then the muscles tightening. For somebody like me, most of my issues are coming from the muscle tightening here and there. For people with um, that need their albuterol more often or having more daily inflammation that or daily symptoms, that means that they must have some underlying inflammation that every time that that's causing them to constantly have issues. And so then when they kind of open up their airways with the albuterol, it's still not enough because there's still a lot of swelling in the airways. So the way that I like to kind of show it is that like, you know, here's an open airway. And if you have inflammation in that airway, then that leads to less opening. And then on top of that, if your muscles are tightening up, then there's no space. However, if you have an open airway and, um, and then you have a little bit of the muscle tightening, you still have space to breathe, right? And so for the patients that just seem to never be able to feel comfortable and constantly are having symptoms, that means they need to be on a controller medication that will help with that underlying inflammation and swelling in the airways and not just with the muscle tightening. So, um, so I hope that makes sense, but that's kind of like the general gist of how you should think about a controller medication. Does it seem like this person has underlying inflammation that we need to control and that they're not just having just a little bit of that muscle tightening sensation? And that's really what decides and also classifying the patient as, you know, persistent if they're in that moderate to severe persistent category, they have to be on a controller medication. And even if they're in that mild persistent, they have to be on a controller medication because they're having symptoms much too frequently and they need something to control the underlying inflammation. So for him, I would suggest that, um, you know, number one, he shouldn't have the dog in his room because the, the bedroom should be his safe space. Um, number two, an air purifier does help with animal dander. So he could think about investing in an air purifier. Um, number three, if, you know, if this continues and if we end up having to put him on, um, multiple medications for his asthma, we might want to think about how can we desensitize him to his dog. And so once we have his asthma under control, we could think about starting him on allergy immunotherapy or allergy shots to kind of reduce his allergy to the dog itself. And that would help bring, get his asthma under control and bring him off of some of the medications that we would have to put him on to control his asthma. So these are all the kind of things that we would think about for that patient. And then um, I think that's it. And then if you guys have any questions about telemedicine, and then, you know, this is essentially my Instagram and my email. So we can kind of do some questions. I know that was a lot, so I'm sorry, but it's a big topic. Thank you so much, Dr. Gupta. Um, <clears throat> that was awesome. And there were a lot of really good questions. Um, so we can start getting to some. One question that someone asked was, um, if you could kind of explain the mechanism or the process by which people like quote unquote outgrow their asthma, or if that's like even a possibility. Yeah, so, you know, as far as outgrowing your asthma, um, 
you will all, no one is cured of asthma. So there's no way like to cure asthma, but there are periods of someone's life where, um, like, for example, my asthma was a lot worse when I was a kid, and then it gradually got better over time. But does it mean that I don't have underlying asthma? No, I still have asthma, and it could still be triggered depending on what my triggers are. So, um, so yeah, so there's no way to control um, a medication. Or, or to, sorry, there's no way to cure asthma. Um, but there, so when people say they grew out of their asthma, it just might mean that their asthma was more severe when they were little and that they are doing better with their asthma. Great. Thank you so much for clearing that up for us. Another question that someone asked was if strengthening the immune system can help people with asthma, so like vitamin C, vitamin D, and different measures like that, or if that's just not really a way to help control asthma. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, all of those kind of integrative measures, I think that um, it's really important to be healthy. It's really important to have, um, you know, appropriate uh, exposure to sunlight for vitamin D or get it in your diet or, you know, the vitamin C, all of that kind of stuff. So vitamin C, we know in particular, can help with um, viral infections. So like, you know, you can take uh, like airborne, those kind of things. There is some data to show that high doses of vitamin C at the beginning of a viral infection could help um, kind of uh, help um, shorten the lifespan of the virus, right? So meaning like it could help control the viral infection a little bit. That doesn't, that's not, we don't have that data for COVID. So I don't want anyone to think that that's true for, um, you know, uh, with COVID, but there are with influenza and other viruses, they've been, they have seen that there is some benefit to high doses of vitamin C at the beginning of a viral infection. Um, and so, you know, as far as uh, asthma in particular being controlled with those things, I think that there is, um, actually I'm helping on a paper where we're looking at like vitamin D and vitamin C and all those things and looking at the literature to see what they found in asthma. And uh, to be honest, I can't remember off the top of my head what the, what it was about vitamin C and vitamin D and what data we have and to see if it's actually helpful. So if you guys want, I can, I can send you a quick email after and you can share it with your, with everybody um, regarding those two topics. Um, but I do think that alternative or, or complementary medicine is super important. So I think it's really important what we eat, how we take care of ourselves, how we exercise, all of those things are helpful in managing any condition because the stronger your body is, the better it is. And especially exercise for asthma is super important because when you exercise, you're also kind of making, um, it's a way of like uh, strengthening the muscles around your airways. Um, like your diaphragm and things like that, being able to take a nice deep breath is super important. And so, um, you know, not being overweight, um, exercising, all of those things are, are going to help with asthma management. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, we had a few questions kind of asking about environmental factors that are kind of out of your control. Like um, someone was saying, um, you know, being in close proximity to maybe a chemical plant, um, or, you know, being in the cold, if it's a cold-induced um, asthma, like, you know, for instance, if you were living in New York City and it's cold for a very long period of time, um, I guess how those factors um, can be controlled. Yeah, so cold air-induced asthma, so, you know, if, if for patients who find <laughs> that their asthma gets triggered as soon as they go outside and uh, they have a rush of cold air that goes in. What I suggest is like making sure that you have a scarf that you can put over your mouth to kind of control the air and to control, um, you know, that burst of like cold air going in. So just kind of having something and now that we're all masking, you know, that actually can help with that um, kind of cold air induced kind of triggered asthma. So that's one thing for that. Obviously, if you live... Um, you know, a lot of my patients that, for example, the Bronx has the worst rates of asthma. And the reason is, is because a lot of the housing um, in that area is next to um, like major highways and um, things like that. And when you're next to a major highway, you're going to get more pollution um, 
from the cars and the exhaust and all of that stuff. And that's going to ultimately enter your home because then a lot of those homes also don't have appropriate air conditioning. So people leave their windows open. And so it's this horrible cycle, right? And how do we prevent that? And how do we control for those things? Those are things that as doctors, we um, you know, I've cried with my patients before because they've shown me pictures of like their living conditions and it's, it's horrible. And there's not really anything that I personally can do to take them out of that situation, but we can do more advocacy work. And, you know, that's why I've, um, I work with American Lung Association to do some advocacy work with them to help promote like cleaner air, to help promote, um, better housing and, um, you know, um, all of those kind of things for, for people. But yeah, those are definitely things that we have to think about with our patients, but helping them and saying, you know, keeping your windows shut during certain times of the day. Like for example, when the traffic's really heavy, you wanna keep your windows shut. Um, early in the morning is worse for pollen count. So, you know, checking the pollen count, keeping your windows shut during those times. Um, and, um, you know, doing measures like, as, as much as we can, um, we recommend what we can. But unfortunately, those situations are very difficult. And I've had um, some terrible situations that I, I just, I honestly, I, all I could do was cry because I had no idea what else you could really do to take somebody out of that situation. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for you know talking about that and mentioning efficacy. That's really awesome and really good to think about and consider. So thank you for that. Um, there was an interesting question asking, um, is there a relationship between anemia and asthma? Um, so, you know, um, when you're anemic, that means that um, your oxygen carrying capacity could be reduced, right? So people that have very severe forms of anemia could feel short of breath. Um, and uh, so anything that causes further shortness of breath could obviously um, make like if you have an underlying lung condition and then you have um, another condition that's making you short of breath, you're going to feel worse. So, um, you know, again, our body is a whole. And so we really have to think uh, one condition can definitely affect the other condition. Um, but, uh, you know, is it something that I normally screen for in my asthmatics? Not necessarily, but it's just, you know, one of those uh, things that, especially in our pediatric patients that we watch out for in general, um, up to a certain age, um, just to make sure that everything's going in the right direction. And then for older, for, you know, adult patients or anybody else, if they're complaining of, you know, feeling cold, feeling tired, feeling short of breath, any of those things, then we would also screen them maybe for anemia too. But again, that's like very severe anemia where somebody would have a lot of those symptoms. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you so much for answering that question for us. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we could get to maybe one more question and then just start, start wrapping up. Mm -hmm. um, so someone was asking, you kind of mentioned briefly bronchial thermoplasty. And people are wondering, like, how severe does asthma have to be to perform a procedure? And, like, how often have you performed that? And if you could talk kind of about the numbers there. Yeah. So, you know, it's a fairly new procedure, I would say, in the last, like, five years, if I could guess. Um, and I personally don't perform it. So it's something that's done by um, an interventional pulmonologist. Um, and it would be done like in, uh, in a hospital setting um, under very controlled measures. And, um, and it's not done that often, right? And your asthma has to be very severe. You have to be at that point where you've tried multiple therapies and nothing seems to be helping. And then this is the one thing that we think might help you. Um, or for example, for patients that are um, that can't tolerate some of the, the medications, some of the biologics, they've had reactions, things like that. So it's really, um, again, it's one of those uh, treatments that's that's kind of end of the road, like we want to do something because if we don't, then, you know, the person would do poorly regardless. And so then the risk benefit ratio is what we always have to think about with these kind of procedures. And, and that's true with a lot of things in medicine is the risk versus benefit, right? Um, and it's also shared decision-making. Um, 
uh, you know, letting the patient know these are the risks, these are the benefits, and this is why we think you should do it. And then it's a decision amongst everybody to kind of um, figure out what, what the best plan of action is and what somebody wants to do. Sometimes people feel that something like bronchial thermoplasty will just make it so that they don't have to use any medications and that's the that's the way that they want to go regardless of the side effects. So there's, there's a lot of things that go into those decisions, but I think as doctors, we just have to give people all of the options and make sure that we present them clearly and, and let them know what the risks and benefits are and which one we would prefer for them and then go from there. Awesome. Thank you so much for all of your expertise and your advice today. Um, we always ask this as we wrap up. So if you could leave us with one piece of advice today um, as college students, pre-med students, post-bac students navigating our pre-med journey during the time of COVID, what that would be. Um, I think that uh, you guys are already doing it. You're, you're already putting yourselves out there. You're already like seeking out other ways to kind of get exposure to the medical field. Um, you know, and I think that at the end of the day, um, medicine is a long road, but if it's truly something that you want to do, it can be accomplished. And I just, like I said in the beginning, I just want everybody to know that, um, you know, it, the end result, uh, the way that you get there, it doesn't, um, you know, there's so many different paths. And I think that's what people kind of fail to remember. You kind of think, okay, I need to do four years of undergrad and then I need to get into medical school and I just need to get started. And that's not always the case. And, um, and you have to just um, be patient with the journey and enjoy it right along the way and kind of enjoy the moments that we have. And so I think that that's my biggest advice is just really slow down, really enjoy what, what you have, which is your youth too, you know? There's only a certain time in your life when you can just run around and have fun too. And you have to remember that. Um, you'll always have time to work. Once you're a doctor, that's, you know, that's all you're gonna do is help people. And, and that's great. But, you know, along the way, you want to enjoy your life. Um, so that's, that's always my advice to people, especially younger people, because I look back and I'm like, wow, time just flew by. And I wish I had done that. I wish I had done this or, you know, whatever. And so, um, so you just want to remember that and you really want to enjoy your friends. You want to enjoy your family when we can travel and you, you, you're able to, you know, travel or just take a walk or whatever. I just think that thinking about the future too much all the time is not healthy. And that's, 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 I think the most important thing is you really have to be in the present moment and the future and your goals and all of those things slowly, they'll all come to fruition. And that's just, that's just how life goes. Thank you so much Thank for you that. So much. Um, I feel like, yeah, we're all in our like late teens, early 20s, and we feel like we're running out of time. It's crazy. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. We all really needed to hear that today. Yes, you're welcome. And yeah, and you guys are all doing a great job just by even being here. So um, you're taking that kind of step forward. But again, have fun, you know, have fun. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you so much. Instagram is there on the screen. And if you guys have any more questions for her, um, she posts really great things. So go ahead and follow her and we will definitely stay in touch and talk soon. Great. Thanks guys. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you again.